Thanks for the kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, thanks for this invitation to this great workshop on near-term quantum computing. And well, unsurprisingly, this is what this talk will be about. And so this is a fresh and exciting field of research that is it's hard to deny receiving a lot of attention these days. In fact, this is cutely not only the first, but the second conference on that very subject in Europe this week, <laughs> which is quite, quite remarkable. Um, at the same time, I hope it's fair to say that this field is a bit in a kind of gold rush state where people are getting very excited, they are running around, they find gold nuggets every once in a while, but then it's also hard to kind of get a handle on the field to see what's really on the plate and kind of, for example, in this heuristically driven field, understand in what precise way we can hope to get speed ups in what specific sense. And well, the bad news is that this talk will not be as ambitious to kind of tackle these important uh, questions. That's uh, the bad news here, even though I would love to. But the good news is that one can say things in rigorous terms in this largely heuristically driven field of near-term computing. And we will have a look at kind of three um, instances of, of, of this kind, which is kind of our secret plan in this field of research, no longer secret. Um, and you will see what this is all about. And this is what we have in mind um, in this talk. So the guiding vision of all this, needless to say, is this compelling idea of a fully fledged fault torrent quantum computer being able to solve some NP problems in polynomial time and the like, famous Shor's algorithm or the sister algorithms of um, uh, other hidden subgroup problems being the most uh, prominent examples um, of this kind, presumably. But then, alas, a few of us think that these large-scale fault torrent quantum computers are something that we will have in any uh, near future. What we do have is small and warm and wet, well, maybe not so much wet, but noisy quantum computers uh, for that matter. Um, but, but this is still a, an exciting state of affairs. So, I would like, or we would rather like to see the glass half full than half empty and say, well, we have um, small and noisy quantum computers and um, obviously mostly driven by American uh, protagonists in the industrial sector, this feat of actually going into the lab and building these devices has gained a lot of momentum rather recently. We know the usual suspect um, implementations of 53 qubit IBM machines say, we you know the, the Google 53 superconducting device or the 72 uh, qubit bristle cone, Rigetti made announcements or the more in stealth mode psi-quantum effort of building a linear optical photonic uh, quantum computer of its kind. So they, well, they're small, smallish, intermediate size. They are surely rather noisy in the sense of not too high average gate fidelities, but they do exist. And it is interesting to see that these guys are there in a way that seemed science fiction not very long ago. It's a very interesting state of affairs these days. I was just in, in Google Labs two weeks ago, so it's really a very impressive enterprise that they are building up there in, in Santa Barbara. Good. So given that these guys are small, warm, and wet, so it makes sense to put as much as we can on the, on the classical side and think of classical computers running most of the show and having the circuit in the center as a parametrized circuit with some knobs that you can tune in and taking measurements, taking these measurements in, making a classical computation of a kind, and then updating the, the, the parameters and iterating the problem in, in, in one way or, or the other. And that's a, a setting that gives rise to heuristically a very good performance in many um, instances. And maybe one of the most prominent and maybe also simplest variants of that kind are, well, unsurprisingly variational quantum circuits where you have a some circuit given with some knob, some variational parameters, and you aim to minimize the expectation value from some real or fictitious Hamiltonian in an attempt of, say, minimizing the ground state energy in a variational principle with 
rather obvious applications in quantum chemistry, and maybe less so also in condensed matter problems of seeing how the, how the physics or the chemistry of a problem is working again with good heuristic performance in actual uh, um, tests. A slightly more refined version of such a variation algorithm is not so much focused at learning interesting stuff about physical situations, but rather aims at finding good approximate solutions to combinatorial optimization problems like uh, MaxCut or so in quantum approximate optimization algorithms, QAWA as it's um, often uh, called, where the goal is to determine some binary string that as well as possible maximizes a given classical uh, objective function over binary words where the aim is to find a string that achieves a certain um, desired approximation uh, ratio. And the setup is that you, you construct the Hamiltonian that encodes the objective function into the Hamiltonian in some layered sequence one would call the Hamiltonian as a function of time inter laced with single qubit gates, and again the Hamiltonian, in order to find a good approximate solution to this combinatorial optimization problem. That's, again, compelling. It's very exciting. It's rather well understood for single-layer settings, not so much for multi-layer settings, except there's an increasing body of like, heuristic evidence that this works well, but more needs to be done in this field um, after all. So the upshot is, well, these are exciting ideas. There's heuristic evidence that there's something on the plate here. But it seems much to kind of to put this on a more systematic basis and make progress, it would be nice to have some sort of satisfactory answer to a question of the type whether there's any hope to say something rigorous on near-term quantum computation whatsoever. And of course, the big aim is to kind of understand quantum algorithms with a hard recovery guarantee and a speed up promise of some kind. But before this is on the plate, it would be nice to kind of identify key building blocks in their functioning in a precise and rigorous fashion and establish that what we call in the group sometimes proof pockets, like something that's um, a kind of a, a key building block in near-term quantum algorithms where one can really precisely and quantitatively and rigorously understand the performance of that part, hoping that if these guys are, are put together and then the knots are connected, that one gets a more comprehensive and systematic picture of how near-term computing functions um, after all. And this is what, this, what the rest of this talk will be about, also between you and the coffee break, if we keep it short. And we have a look at, well, somewhat superficial look at three examples of that sort of a, of a proof pocket if, if you want. The first one is concern, oh, no, there's one, one last thing. Um, that's about finding variational algorithms altogether, but there's will be one addendum at the very end, which is there's not only short circuit, small circuits, but also short circuits, and we will ask the question what sense you can do trade-offs and even think of the computational power of short quantum circuits, like what is the computation power of short quantum circuits or even unit time quantum circuits, asking what you can do with a single layer of quantum gates and then doing something in what way you can expect a quantum advantage, not with deep circuits, complicated circuits, but single layer quantum circuits at the end of the day. Good. So first proof pocket on what we like to call stochastic or quantum, doubly stochastic gradient descent. And I mean, it's supposed to be a bit of a joke, but you will see what this is, what this is about. Now, variation algorithms come in several forms and, and, and flavors, but in one way or the other, they have like knobs, they have variational parameters of some kind, and some loss function that's supposed to be optimized, and one aims at finding the right places of these knobs to optimize the cost function in Quava, in VQE, in variants of quantum machine learning, in all these readings, there's some cost function to be optimized, and one has to find the right parameters to pick, that's not such an easy task. There's gradient-free methods, but what one 
commonly accepts as doing the right thing is that you find the gradient of going downhill in the right fashion, which means you have to find the partial derivatives of some cost function with respect to the knobs. And then once you know the partial derivatives, you can go downhill and kind of at least find a, a good local optimum in your cost function. That's great. So how do you get the gradient in the first place? Well, these are quantum systems. You go into the lab and measure, and what's usually done is, okay. <laughs> kind of funny to speak at a church. Anyway, never mind. Um, um, so you make many, many measurements. You go to the lab and repeat the same measurement over and over and again. You get expectation values of a kind. From these expectation values, you get the partial derivatives, you get the gradient, then you find the right update rule to find your best knobs in the next step. That's wonderful in principle, but thinking about this for a moment, I mean, expectation values are a pretty expensive thing in that context. You have to, I mean, that's in this idealization of many repetitions of the same measurement, but that here means you run the circuit many and many times, which is something you maybe do not want. There's a, a slight um, simplification in that many practical problems encountered happen to satisfy what is called the parameter shift rule, which means that the um, partial derivatives of expectation values versus changing the knobs in the setting can often be seen as linear combinations of the same expectation values with parameters with slightly shifted parameters, which is a, a, a nice feature that can be established, uh, made use of to simplify like gradient-based schemes of variational optimization of some um, So We will also make use of that feature later. But still, expectation values are not as innocent as they may look. You have to run the circuit many, many times, get the expectation value, estimate that. This seems excessively costly. So is this needed? Do, does one need to have expectation values um, after, after all? Is there help? And that's I mean, this is a super simple idea, but it's kind of nice how well this works. And you also have a, a, a proof how this works. And we get inspiration in this approach from, if you want, stochastic gradient methods that are, well, ubiquitous in machine learning to say the least. So it's kind of this machine learning is the study of stochastic gradient in a certain sense, or where the gradient update rule is replaced by some update rule that will depend on the gradient, but that may have some stochastic component in the update rule in one way or, 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 or the other. And the advice given is very simple. You go into the same lab, you do the same kind of measurement, but just measure what you can. How many times you can, do what you can, take the data you can have, and then take those data. That's the method, basically. So you don't think of expectation values. They are kind of an abstraction anyway in the limit of many, many measurements. You rather take like n measurements of the same sort. Somehow, maybe one measurement or many, as, depending on what you think you can afford. That gives rise not to an expectation value, but to a, a faithful um, estimator, an unbiased estimator of the expectation value for um, pretty obvious um, uh, reasons. And then, this allows for an estimation of the gradient in a very economical, uh, economical fashion. So you just measure s something as many times as you can. You take these data. From that, you get, get an unbiased estimator of the gradient. It's not the gradient, but an unbiased estimator of the gradient. From that, you get an un unbiased, no, for the partial derivatives, for that, you get an unbiased estimator of the gradient of, of the, the partial derivatives of the cost function with nk settings if the um, uh, parameter shift rule is made use of. And using that update rule, you get a stochastic gradient descent method that we like to dub doubly gradient descent in the sense that it's a stochastic gradient descent method, but some of the stochasticity, stochasticity comes from quantum measurement that are kind of intrinsically random, it's kind of doubly random as an update. You just measure, get unbiased estimators, and then you, you, um, you uh, run for it. So this is a kind of a, um, a proxy of the uh, algorithm used. It's kind of a stochastic sample rule of using unbiased estimator, finding update rules for 
um, given um, learning data and circuit parameters start in some setting and then you kind of make the stochastic update rule um, after all. This is a very simple idea indeed. Um, there is some devil in the detail in that it's still a very long, like 20 pages uh, setting to work things out for the various um, ramifications on variational quantum um, eigensolvers. You would have like a, a Hamiltonian sampling problem. After all, that's actually reminiscent of, of digital quantum simulation. Quama is pretty intricate. The multi-round setting is not so easy for the, the, the way the gradient enters the game. We have looked at mean squared error quantum classifiers in, in quantum machine learning where the a nonlinear function, cost function, comes into play, but we have kind of looked at like, have specific theorems for the specific settings um, here at, 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 at hand. Now, the nice thing is that that works incredibly well, but on top of that, that's kind of the, the kind of philosophical meta point of this talk, that we also have recovery guarantees, so we can prove convergence of this kind. So, of course, there's the additional problem that the the energy landscape may be very rugged, and there's this kind of bar and plateau problem. That's another problem. But given the local optimum, you can always prove that you will go to the best local optimum with a number of runs and as a recovery guarantee of necessarily going to, 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 the, to the optimum. So here is a kind of an example statement of that kind. So given a cost function that satisfies some condition that's kind of a, like a strong form of convexity if you want. You can apply the scheme to T steps and then you get a promise of how close your, not your um, cost function, but your expected cost function as a function of the runs is to the true cost function evaluated at the nearby um, optimum that you have. So you get a promise how many times you have to estimate run that to get a, a promise for the estimated cost function um, as a recovery guarantee as a theorem which is nice to have. So you can run this, it's way more efficient, but you also show, I will get to the right optimum in, in, the, right, in the right fashion. That's kind of the plain vanilla um, theorem. We also have variants of that in these various ramifications for VQE, Kiwawa. It has a bit of a dialect. This is in the paper, I, I'm happy to say more about this. So this is, is our theorem side. It also works extremely well in practice. We've tested this on, say, variation quantum eigensolvers, Kiwawa also on this, um, on this machine learning problem, where it's kind of cute to see that even very small number of measures, even single shot measurements, you go in the, into the lab and you will make every measurement once can be good enough to get a good, a good method. You just, you, you shoot into the air and you get numbers and that's still good to get a gradient uh, method as an, as an update rule. You would also know how well this works using the theorem that I, I, I mentioned. So the lesson of all this, I would say, is that by overcoming a prejudice, the prejudice of that estimation value should be measured. That's great in many settings. In the near term, it's no good. They're expensive. They're evil. Um, significantly more efficient methods can be uh, devised for near-term settings by just acknowledging that you can think of um, unbiased estimators, take those data, and then get still an update rule with a proven recovery Guarantee. So that's kind of a, an example of a poop pocket. It's not the full story, but in this setting, you really know precisely what's going on and why and with what effort and what recovery guarantee you have. 20 minutes. Wonderful. Um, which brings me to my second and third and shorter, so don't worry about your coffee, um, proof pocket. Um, so well, the first one was on having a variation algorithm, having certain knobs, and asking how would you meaningfully change those knobs and update those knobs. The second question is what you can achieve with those knobs in the first place. So what is the um, expressive, what's kind of, the bigger question is what, what do circuits or short circuits represent? What do they do? And what is their expressive power after all, meaning like cert picking certain knobs, what are the, for example, what's the reachable set of unitaries you can get, or when applied to a dummy input vector, what is the reachable set of state vectors you can achieve upon varying the variational knobs that you have there, which is what is commonly called the expressive power of um, this network. So it's kind of very important, for example, thing of Quawa, where you want to say, how many rounds do I need to do in order to do something? And, you want to have a good understanding 
what a given parameter circuit actually represent, what the expressive power is. This seems a very important question that's strangely understudied. I hope this is fair to say. I don't want to offend anyone. Um, it's not easy to come up with rigorous statements. There's some work on short circuits in, in Hilbert space. There's a bit of work on uh, Clifford gates, but there is a lack of understanding in the literature of what, um, what the expressive power of short um, quantum circuits is. So here we have made some progress. I'm quite, quite happy about it. We joined forces here with our friends in, in Garching around um, Gnassi's group where we look at a setting that seems good to make like, precise and, and um, concise statements of a kind. It's on probability distributions that are captured by tensor networks, having in mind that there's a deep connection between uh, tensor networks on the one hand and quantum circuits. They can be contracted to be certain tensor networks and also probabilistic graphical models that give rise also to tensor networks, but now in the real valued non-negative reading where one can see that probabilistic graphical models can be embedded in certain instances of real valued uh, structured um, tensor networks of a kind that make play an important role in generative modeling and unsupervised learning and, and, and so on. So the question that guided us was how can probability distributions after all be represented by tensor networks? There's more than one way, as you might imagine. Um, here's one, which is maybe the most well-known compelling one. It's a, called a matrix product state or many paper state, MPS, for good reasons. Um, also tensor train, I mean, this has the reason that this has been reinvented many times. It comes from uh, finitely correlated states in the C star algebraic quantum many body setting, also from DMRG in the condensed matter world. Tensor trains came in later in numerical analysis. This is just a linearly structured tensor network where these guys here represent tensors, they're boxes, and the, the legs sticking out would be the indices that um, well, represent the, well, the degree of the tensor. These would be degree three tensors in the middle, and uh, you would um, contract indices that are connected, which means you would sum over the joint index. So that's a, a, a linear tensor network. It's what is called a tensor train that immediately arises in probabilistic methods, graphical models, where you can see that this also hidden Markov chains can be immediately mapped onto uh, ramifications of that kind where the entries would be um, non-negative and, uh, and, and revalued. Now, how do you represent probability distributions in such a form? Obviously, one way of doing it is you take tensors, the entries of which are non-negative revalued. Because then you, up, upon, up to normalization, get a, a probability distribution out at your, call them physical indices, some to physics -y train. You, might, you know what I mean, these guys sticking, sticking out there. That truly gives rise to a probability distribution. Uh, but of course, you can also have like non-negative real numbers in the tensors and still have a distribution, or even complex valued tensors that are tuned in such a way so that the guy at the end of the day, the, the physical legs would be still non-negative real valued, so would still give rise to a probability distribution. That's perfectly possible. These are kind of already three ways of representing a probability distribution in terms of tensor networks by taking the field as the complex numbers, the real numbers, and the non-negative real numbers. Wonderful. First kind. Second kind is like a, a bone machine, if you want. Um, in physics terms, this is nothing but a density operator of a pure state. You will immediately recognize that. That's another way of representing a probability distribution. You can see this as a Born machine as short quantum circuits give rise to such a guy. If you think of a, of a short quantum circuit, you can contract the quantum circuit and then see what the probability distribution is upon measurement at the output. Then you see that the distribution using the Born rule is just this kind of vector and dual vectorized guy of this form, which means that this is like has an immediate connection to, to short quantum circuits when you say, I want to represent these guys as probability distributions. And the last 
version, so Gamma has worked on that, is the locally purified uh, guys, where there's an extra bond in the middle. For the physics, physics trained people, this would be a matrix product operator that's um, inherently positive semi-definite. You can see this as a locally purified state. It's a, it is what it is. It's, you have an extra bond in the middle. You have a kind of a structured, the guy down there is the, the conjugate of the upper thing. It's a structured tensor network of, um, of such a kind. And that again, if you pick stuff suitably, parameterizes a probability distribution. It comes from circuits. It comes from um, probability graphical models. So these are ways of doing that. So how are they connected? So what is the expressive power of these respective ways of parameterizing probability distributions? And well, it's, it's clear that they're all complete in the sense that upon choosing sufficiently many variables, you can represent an arbitrary probability distribution, but that's not the heart of the matter. The matter is with how many numbers can you represent what probability distributions to good approximation, yeah? And then you ask like, what are the respective overheads? You have one representation, say, if I want to go to another picture, what is the overhead I need to represent this one in the other picture, and so on. These are kind of mutual relative expressivities, which is something we urgently need, and this is a kind of nice proxy where this question can be almost completely hammered down to, 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 a, complete, to a complete answer. And the surprise is actually all, after all. So how does this work? We you look first at the matrix problem, or the matrix versions of, the, of that problem, which partially meant proving new theorems, partially when going to the library and looking at known theorems of, of, on ranks. You would not know how many ranks there are. Actually, also, there's one question mark here. that I have the most difficult and compelling matrix problem that I ever encountered. So if you, are, if you want to find a challenge of a matrix problem, I'm happy to invite you to three pizzas in a row if you can solve this problem. Ask me afterwards if you want to know this matrix problem. Um, you tried very hard. Anyway, up to that, this is a kind of table on respective ranks. There's the, the TT rank, that's the, this, the, the bond dimension of the MPS if you want. There is the, the Born rank, which is the, the MPS dimension of the the Born machine, there's the pure rank, which is the, the extra leg in the locally purified guys. And this table basically says that if you represent a, a two tensor in the left, in, in this row sense, the column says what overhead you would have in the rank if you go, went to the other uh, representation. And if there's a function like in, uh, x squared, you would do, be able to do that with an x squared overhead. And if there's no, it means there is no functional dependence, meaning that the overhead that you can have can be unbounded and arbitrarily large. Even on the matrix level, meaning it can be depend on the unbounded uh, physical dimension that, that, that you have. That's the, the kind of the, the matrix problem, but this you can uplift in a scalable fashion to the many-body problem, which is a kind of acute insight that you can really talk about probability distributions in the many-body sense. X, oh, that's just like, if the rank is like, um, like, uh, like x, the TT rank, then the representation with positive guys would be also of x type. Or x squared means that if you go to the, to the Born rank, you would get a quadratic overhead when representing that. This is actually an obvious thing. You have two MPS. You can do a Born representation by just doubling, uh, squaring the, the respective rank. But there's a couple of ones that are highly non-obvious. So there's a couple of surprises, as I said. One surprise is that going complex can help a lot. In fact, uh, using complex instead of real tensors leads to an arbitrary large and unbounded reduction in the number of parameters in the network. Even though you are representing non-negative real numbers, it can help in the tensor network representation to go complex while going real at the end of the day. In fact, in an unbounded fashion, so in the system size, you get an, an arbitrarily large um, separation of, of a kind. Also, the locally purified states have a provably better expressive power than any of the other representations, again, with an unbounded and potentially exponentially large separation in the system size, meaning all representations can do all distributions, but if you do a locally purified one, you can be exponentially better than other representations of actually spelling out the same distribution. This kind of a surprising thing. So there's, there's kind of the wonder weapon that's, a, in a way, a better representation, at least from the perspective of expressive power that's better than the other ones to um, represent um, 
basis vectors after all this. And um, this, leads, this is a kind of a, a rigor statement. We also we were too tempted to look at the performance of these various settings in different learning algorithms, and the expressivity is also matched by numerical experiments on learning algorithms. Let me not too much go into detail here, but I'm happy to say more, um, more later. So the lesson is that a rigorous assessment of expressivity can lead to surprises, and this is a nice proxy of, in a very specific setting, answering a question very comprehensively, the important question of representing distributions in terms of tensor networks, where the mutual expressivity can be very nicely and quantitatively understood, and there's exponential overheads from one to the other, which is surprising. That's great. We need more of that. I think this is a very healthy way of thinking about this. It would be nice to see what finite round core have in store, what short structured quantum circuits have in store. It would be good to see what the expressive power is of near-term machinery to see what the power is of such near-term algorithms after all. Which brings me 30 minutes to the last uh, proof pocket on certified quantum advantages that are receiving a lot of attention these days. I think I have to introduce very little. I was just in, in uh, California two weeks ago, as I said, and it was really funny in that um, you could, every Uber driver knows about supremacy, and you take an, a random free supermarket newspaper, um, it will talk about quantum supremacy. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Anyway, the guys at Google were like very down to earth. It was interesting to see. And um, so just the task here is to find some problem no matter how interesting, how boring, how whatever, of some kind of running a circuit for which there's strong evidence that you cannot do this problem, solve the same task efficiently on a classical computer. And one of the, the most discussed settings is the one of a random circuit where you run a circuit consisting of universal gates. And if this circuit of universal gates is deep enough, you get anti-concentration, you can say that the distribution you get out at the end of the day is so intricate and has so funny tails so that you cannot sample from that distribution on the classical computer. Or slightly more formally said, still not technically said, one cannot approximate the output distribution of a deep random circuit and classically up to a constant error in the total variation distance. Unless you get a collapse of the Pernam hierarchy on the third level. Never mind, so you can do this experiment and you get data and then you say, is it can you resample it? You find you cannot run the same task on a classical supercomputer. That's great. It has been done. It's a spectacularly milestone. It is important to think of these things, even though they're not practical. This is a very important step in the field. There's no denying. Of course, there's the question, right, we've done that. How would we know we are right? How can we find out we do this, some experiment of this kind? How can we know that we have done that experiment? So can we efficiently black box verify the output distribution of such a sampling experiment? And that means you do some experiment of that kind, both on sampling or whatever, what, whatnot. You go into the lab, you get samples, and black box verification means you take these samples, and if the samples are right, you say, yes, they're right. And if they're wrong, you say, no, they're wrong. That's black box verification. Okay. Slightly more technically put, it is a black box verification algorithm is an algorithm that takes samples, and if the distribution you get these samples from is precisely right, hypothetically, then your test should accept with a high probability, say two thirds, at least. And if you are at least epsilon away in the total variation distance, the test should say no with high probability. And in the middle you say whatever, that's, a, that's the common way, like a weak membership of saying that either you've done it or not done it, and that would be sample efficient if you take polynomially many samples, after all. Note this is only about sampling, and you can grant the, the, the algorithm unlimited co uh, computational power. So even exponential computational power is just about samples, samples alone. So how, how, can you, how can you do that? Now there's actually short, there is probably distributions you can, you can black box verify. If they're very peak, you can take polynomially many samples and really hard verify that the distribution is the right distribution. It's much more challenging if you have a flat distribution after all, like an anti-concentrating um, distribution in one way or, or, or the other. Now the machinery behind this black box verification on the mathematical level, don't get me too much into detail, but it's, it's really cute because we encountered the, 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 the cutest norm I've seen in my life that enters here. 
it's like this, um, this uh, PE minus epsilon uh, max norm, which is you take a distribution, you chop off the largest value, you chop off the integrated smallest values until you get epsilon together, and then you take the Rennie two-thirds norm. Oh, that's the norm that matters here. <laughs> and that kind of governs black box verification. And then you can ask, can you do black box verification of IQP circuit, boson sampling, random circuit sampling, and so on? Interestingly, not only can you not do it, so one cannot uh, do uh, verification of boson sampling, IQP circuit, random circuits by looking at um, samples alone, but the very fact that you cannot do it is very closely linked to the very fact that you that is a hard problem to, to sample from that in the first place. So you can go into the lab, but you cannot verify you've done the same thing. Relatedly, but mathematically slightly different is the same, but that for any quantum circuit of that kind, that's a slightly longer classical circuit that will be different, sure, but that you cannot operationally distinguish from the other circuit. So you cannot black box verify sampling algorithms of that kind. You have to have further assumptions. Now there's a last bit I want to say but I'm, I'm perfect in time, which is there is a caveat, or there, there is a solution to this, which I like, um, in that there is, that's something we've spent quite some time with over the last years, when in an attempt of finding the simplest possible quantum advantage scheme we could come up with, that's the simplest scheme we could come up with, where you start with a circuit, you do a random circuit, no, you do a red circuit, but not random, and also not a deep circuit, but you do a unit depth circuit. You start with a product state, you do a unit depth circuit of commuting gates. There's not much in time, but everybody sees only the neighbor. A unit depth circuit of commuting gates, and, um, and of course there's also no input. There's no randomness, there's no adaptivity. You can equivalently also think of this as a unit time evolution of an easing Hamiltonian, for constant time, that's the same thing, it's commuting anyway. Think of unit time circuits, uh, unit time evolution or unit time circuits, it's like one layer of circuits. There's no long range entanglement, besides, of course, you can also compute every expectation value efficiently. That's conjugated, you in your head, that's very easy. It's product state, one layer of circuit, with a proven hardness claim up to constant error in the total variation distance. You say, how is this possible? Where's even the input to the algorithm? Wait a minute, there's no gates, no adaption, no whatever, but there's no input, there's no randomness. How can there be even a, a computational problem of a kind? Interestingly, it's kind of the measurements you do that both read out and insert the, the randomness into the algorithm. It's kind of mathematically equivalent to a, a random circuit, although you don't have to physically implement the circuit. It's just mathematically equivalent. What you do is product states, one unit depth circuit, and you measure out in a non-adaptive fashion. I'm happy to say more about this. It's a long and winding argument, but product states, unit depth circuits, and measuring is good enough to get a quantum advantage scheme with the same claim, and there's no, you can even show average case hardness for certain error types and prove the anti-concentration that enters the, the mathematical proof. But there's another feature one has, this has, which is it can be efficiently verified with quantum measurements. You can do measurements of a very similar kind of the than the, 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 the sampling itself. And then you, you get data, and when the noise levels are too high, you say, oh dear, my noise levels are too high. Too bad, I have to try harder. But if the noise levels, then, then the red light goes on and say, oh, write another grant, do something. But if the green light goes on, it's not just building trust in the functioning or say, yeah, it's kind of looking good, it's kind of cool. The, the, the numbers that you get, give a hard bound to the very quantity that enters the complexity theoretic proof, so it gives a hard bound to the total variation distance of the distribution. So if the green light goes on, you can conclude that I have done the right experiment, I have done a quantum advantage, I have done the right thing in the right limit. So that's great, but then what comes out? You don't know. That's kind of even philosophically interesting that you can make a measurement, you can say I'm right, you can verify the correctness of something, but you cannot use that information to predict how the sampling experiment, what the sampling experiment does at the end of the day. You have to go into the lab, you have to do it, but you can verify your right, say, I'm right. But what is it? I don't know, but I'm right. It's kind of interesting that the setting they can be hard verified in a very strong sense with quantum detectors, but 
you cannot predict the outcome at the end of the day, which is, uh, which is a neat thing. So it's like a very nice way of, similar way of approving this in a way where the lesson is that quantum advantage schemes can be certified in certain settings with quantum detectors. They don't have to be perfect, but they should be quantum. But given this data, you can conclude, I have done the right thing. I have a verified quantum advantage of a kind with unit depth circuit, no deep circuits, but one layer of, there's hardly, it's borderline depth to being classical. It's a commuting one layer circuit. It's not very quantum. But that's good enough to get, at least for that purpose, a summary. It's kind of a bit funny. Wonderful. 40 minutes, it's a good moment to come to the end. So in this talk, I try to convey the message that it can be a fun and fruitful enterprise to think of. But of course, you all want the, the big thing. But before reaching that, it can be nice to see, see, look at elementary key building blocks of near-term algorithms, in particular variational algorithms, and see what's in store as a rigorous statement to have like some pillars where you can hold yourself to, to get a bit of a systematic understanding of how this field is about, what this field is about, and what is in store for future applications in a kind of systematic fashion. So this is kind of the small quantum computer that we would like to see grow and foster. We have to water it nicely to make it flourish and, and um, become bigger. But at the same time, it's our duty to understand the quantum software part and ask what can we do with it and how to precisely understand these machines after all. I had a, an invitation to kind of a bigger program, no longer secret, but our program is to look at these proof pockets. I presented three of them where in the first one we had an improved gradient based method for variational methods that are not only significantly more efficient, you just shoot into the air, but you also have a proven recovery guarantee in a rigorous fashion that you take this data and you know you have the right update rule for your gradient, which is nice to have. And we need more of that, but it's a nice way of systematically knowing what to pick. The second part was, if we know what to pick, what does the circuit represent? What's the expressive power of a circuit? Then we look at the important um, subcase of tensor networks that represent distributions, and we found that there's strange surprises of the mutual expressive power of very natural representations of tensor networks that all seem fine but some are much worse than others in a precise sense and can really hammer down the, uh, the respective expressive power in, 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 a, in a stringent and, and concise language. And I'm happy to present you the, the three pizzas worth um, a matrix problem. And in the final bit, we found that product states, unit depth circuits and measuring, they're not very interesting, they're not very quantum, but they're good enough to do a quantum advantage scheme and one that can be hard and stringently verified in the correctness. You cannot predict it, but you can verify that you've done the right thing by taking measurements on unit depth circuits, all the gates of which are commuting. And with this, I would like to very much thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to the questions you might potentially have. Thank you, Jens, for the talk. Um, any questions? Thank you. Um, so I have a question about the, so you're saying the you have quantum advantage with unit depth circuits. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it, with respect to what is this advantage and uh, with respect to which classical counterpart and is this related to, to, the, to the paper by Bravi on quantum advantage with shallow circuits? Ah, um, that's a very good question. I mean, I, I try to be short in the answer. So, um, uh, this is not about comparing algorithms, but this is a kind of a complexity theoretic claim. And all these, like boson sampling, IQP circuit, random circuit, they're all of a similar kind that you say that there cannot be an efficient classical algorithm unless you get a collapse of the polynomial hierarchy to the third level, which is something like, I mean, the, the, the lowest order collapse would be showing that P is NP. It's a higher level version of assuming that P is not, not NP. Um, the, that's the, 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 the setting. In earlier ramifications, there were further assumptions made that are plausible but were unproven. For example, you have to, you have, to have, have that the distribution is very flat. You need an anti-concentration bound, as it's called, the converse of a, of a concentration bound. And this was assumed to be true. In Boson sampling, it's assumed to be true. Here, it's, it's proven to be true. Right? So this kind of, in this sense, it's um, largely assumption-free, I would say, um, except that one says that there is a polynomial hierarchy. 
that's the, I mean, it's a minimum assumption. One has to be aware of the fact that computer science assumptions are much weaker than physics assumptions, but I mean, strictly speaking, to assume that P is not NP is an assumption. The nice work of um, König and Bravi is different in that it, it, it offers less, so to say. The advantage is from log to, to poly, but it makes no assumptions whatsoever, not even complexly theoretic ones. So, okay, that's what this is, but this is, um, does make it a very mild assumption on complexity theory, but then it's, it's, um, it's not comparing just algorithms. That's also interesting. I mean, we've done lots of work in that respect on quantum simulation and so on. That's very compelling and nice and important. No, this, this, is, this is about proofs and showing that there cannot be classic algorithms, no matter what you do. Thank you. But there's more to say about this, but I, you can say this is a coffee break. Um, thanks for your talk. So thanks. concerning your second, second example, I think it's perhaps worth mentioning that um, you can make much more general statements, right, about the ranks of these different decompositions. Uh, well, that's the paper that appeared on the same day, coincidentally, right? Mm -hmm. yep. um, so for example, um, uh, we can define them not only on a 1D line, but on a general simplicial complex. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you can analyze group invariants, and mm -hmm. you can prove like, all sorts of kind of separations uh, between these different kinds of ranks. So I think you can go like way beyond this mm -hmm. statement. Yeah, okay, thanks, it, it, indeed. Um, yeah. yeah, it did cite um, a work of yours. Um, indeed, like what, what this, our work was about is like the, the comprehensive answer in all like 1D type settings. But of course, this is an invitation and Gamma has worked on that, of going beyond that. This is not the end of the, I mean, by no means do I claim this is the end of the story, this is rather invitation. I mean, this line here is meant to be like pockets and then you connect the lines and get a bigger picture in the hope that, I mean, also that's not the end of the story, like having all these pictures together, we understand what is going on here. That's absolutely right, and thanks for um, stressing that. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious about the question that uh, how to represent the probability distribution by tensor networks. I'm wondering why to, why, uh, what's the motivation of uh, uh, representing probability distribution by tensor networks? Why tensor networks? Ah, um, well, there's basically two, two motivations in short. One is that if you have a certain class of classical update rules, like probabilistic models of a certain kind, they naturally give rise to tensor networks if you think hard about them. I mean, it's actually pretty natural if you have a hidden, mark, a hidden Markov model. That basically means you have some degrees of freedom that you pass on and there's a probability distribution, there's a Markov chain on a bigger level. If you think about this for a moment, you realize this is basically like a classical variant of the sequential preparation picture of NPS. So, kinds of classical models, also classical learning, machine learning models give rise to tensor networks in a very natural fashion. So from the perspective of classical machine learning, it's very imperative to understand what these guys do after all, what their expressive power is. That's the classical side. And that's nothing, it's quantum inspired, but classical. But also quantum circuits are interesting. If you think of a quantum circuit, you can say what are the distributions you can get upon measuring at the end of the day of a quantum circuit. And then if you contract the the, the quantum circuit, you, you realize that the contracted, flattened, short circuits give rise to certain tensor networks. Here, the ball machines, if you want to say what the probability distributions are that you get upon measuring on these distributions. So there's a classical motivation to like classical representations of distributions. If you think hard about them, you realize, ah, that's actually tensor networks. We look at the 1D setting, Gamma look at the like, other kind of settings and topologies. Um, for the quantum circuit, you also have something in store where you say, what is the distributions I can get for circuits which you measure, because data ultimately always classical, you get distributions, what are the classical probability distributions you can reach by having short circuits. So both, there's a classical and a quantum motivation. Thank you. Hi, uh, my question is also about the expressivity. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you say something about the separation of the non-negative real case and the real case? Oh. Um, no, I, not, not, not that I know of. Okay. No, I, I, at least I don't. Maybe okay. my course has an idea, but this is, we have not studied, I have not studied this. Um, I don't think so. 
But going complex, is, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but but, so but note, ask? yeah, but note that it matters like how, how the overheads, so to say. I mean, of course, that's the, that's. I mean, the the um, non-negative rank is like the, the the. I mean, it's a question about positive semi definite but the the question is about overheads you have when you represent one by the other, and what how this translates to if you make many many copies of the of, of the state. So, oh, sorry, uh, maybe I should have. Yeah. Perhaps we can discuss it later. Yeah. That's so it's an interesting question. Let's discuss that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying I want to say that one question is like what happens on the matrix level and one question is what happens if you look at larger system sizes. That's all I wanted to say about this. But it's, it's, yeah, these are, some questions are, are solved. Some, as Gemma says, I mean, have a long tradition. I mean, there's reviews on ranks. Like, Indeed, yes. That's also, of course, what we use. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Hans. Quick question about your um, shallow circuits. Yeah. And so on. What are the measurements and what are the two qubit gates? Ah, very easy. Um, the, measure the, the measurements are just Pauli x. You start in a, in a product state. You do a circuit and you measure all Pauli x. Um, the gates are well. If you think of Hamiltonians, it would be a, an easy Hamiltonian like ZZ. If you um, think of circuits, it's a control Z gate. Yeah, I mean, the, in 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 the, the way we look at this, I mean, the, the the proxy is like a you can think of like a cold atomic setting, where you just start off in a in a hyperfine level and then the the the, the gates you do, it's just what is called the controlled collisions. I mean, this was actually not, it's not only doable, it was actually done. There was one of the earliest experiments with cold atoms in 2003, um, in, like, where all these, like, Greiner and Henge and Bloch are all in the same paper um, on, on doing that. And this, on hyperfine levels, this was done. Do you actually know what, this, what came out of this, this controlled collision stuff? You will know, because that's a controlled Z gate. The, the idea was, oh, you get a controlled Z gate. You get an interesting state. What's the power of that? The cluster states, the graph states, came out of the idea, oh, you have this natural interaction. In Innsbruck, that was considered, and like Hans and others look much on that. Like they, they states in the lab, what can you do with them? And then the people abstracted and said, oh, there's a cluster state, a graph state, but that came out of the, the effort of describing this con co co controlled collision experiment. So it's basically cluster state type. And then you make all x. And the verification is also all x and all z. So basically, you call the experimentalist, like, give me data of x and z type, and then I do the rest. That's basically what you do. All right. We should conclude and go to the yeah, coffee break, I guess. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks again.